This video will help you to answer Activity 3 and Activity 4 on the Resource and Talent Planning Module or 5 RST. The activities concentrate on Workforce Planning, that's Activity 3, and for Activity 4 is Succession Planning and Talent Planning. Be mindful when writing your answers for this part of the assignment that you only have about 600 words for each activity and I would suggest that this would be your maximum as six activities need to be covered within the 3,300 word count. Before we look at activities 3 and activity 4, it's important to review what we've covered in this module so far. For activity 1, we concentrated on the labour market and in particular for this activity you need to choose two different countries with different labour markets and then you need to describe how the characteristics of the labour market are within those countries. So for example the public versus the private sector and any differences in pay. Activity 2 concentrated on the skills gap within this country and the different agencies that are working to try to close the skills gap. So we looked at the government's role in apprenticeships. We also looked at employers and how they're leading the way with, uh, with being trailblazers and the standards that they're setting and also the unions in terms of the learning representatives. So for this review, I'd like you to listen to the two podcasts that Andrew has produced and they're both available on Moodle. I hope you found the two podcasts useful. Now before we get into this week's topics, I'd like you to just take five minutes and think about an entry that you can make on your development record. Remember, this needs to link in to one of your objectives that you've entered onto the development plan. So pause the video, take five minutes and make the entry and then come back when you're ready. So let's take a look at question three and question four. Question three is quite simple and asks you to briefly describe the main principles of effective workforce planning and give some examples of any tools that may be used for this. So we'll start to have a look at the definitions of workforce planning and some of the main principles and we'll also look at some of the tools that you could include in this activity. Question 4 also asks for a brief account of HR's role in each of the following. So they want you to include information about developing basic succession and career development plans, contributing to plans for downsizing in an organisation and contributing to the development of job descriptions, person specs and competency frameworks. The aims and objectives of this session closely match Activity 3 and Activity 4. So we'll explore approaches to workforce succession and talent planning and then by the end of the presentation you should be able to discuss workforce planning and make recommendations for its use in different scenarios. You should be able to define succession and, and talent planning and to be able to discuss their use within a business. You will be able to explain a business model and determine how that can be used to aid workforce planning. And you can evaluate the role of HR in workforce succession and talent planning. Before we move on, write down everything and anything that you already know about each of the following. So start with workforce planning and write down everything that you know about workforce planning and try to think of examples in your organisation. Within this section, you should try to come up with a definition of workforce planning. When you've done this, move on to succession planning and do the same. And then finally, move on to talent planning or career development planning as the CIPD call it. You covered talent planning with the first assessment criteria for the assignment 3RTO. So try to remember what you covered in level 3 and write it down here. So pause the video, make some notes and when you're ready continue.
We'll start with workforce planning as this is the basis of your answer for activity three. So I hope in the previous exercise you came up with a definition which is something similar to that given by the CIPD. Their definition is workforce planning is a core process of human resource management that is shaped by the organisational strategy and ensures the right number of people with the right skills in the right place at the right time to deliver short term and long term organisational objectives. I'm sure now that you've heard their definition that you'll start to think, oh yes, I do recognise it. Because loads of companies use the strap line or use the phrase having the right number of people with the right skills in the right place at the right time. It's used in many different organisations. It will just look different from company to company. The next thing I'd like you to do is pause the video, scan the QR code and then read the fact sheet on workforce planning. What you'll need to do is download a free QR code reader onto your smartphone and then scan this code and it will take you straight to the fact sheet on workforce planning. Once you've read the fact sheet, start the video again and we'll start to see how workforce planning links into organisational strategy. The CIPD definition given on the previous slide states that workforce planning is based on or is determined by the business strategy. So let's see how they all fit together. The business strategy, which could be that your business is looking to grow or maybe to downsize, or it could be looking to expand both nationally or even internationally. And this obviously will have an impact on the workforce planning. The usual process is that the business strategy is determined and different elements of the business strategy would be the operational plans. So where and when, um, what are you likely to do? Is it downsize, grow, expand, and so on? You'd have a people strategy. So you'd need to have ideas of what you want from your people, what you want your workforce to look like, and the organizational strategy. Once these are settled on, you'd move on to the next step, which is to analyse and discuss relevant data. So for this, you do a data collection exercise and you'd gain information, so numerical information from across the business. You'd also take information from HR business partners and from business managers. So rather than looking at numerical information or quantitative information, here you're looking at qualitative so you've got some um, figures to use, but you've also got some input. And that's likely to be in the form of um, the skills that people have or the skills that are necessary to perform the future job roles. Once that's been ironed out, the next step is to agree objectives of the plan. And so for this, you would review the labour supply. So you'd look at this, look at the data both internally, so within the organisation, who's available that maybe could take the next step or what numbers are available. And you'd also look externally, so you'd start to examine the external labour market. So this is when you'd start to look at recruiting externally. Another aspect of agreeing the objectives is to review the workforce capability and to assess whether they've got the capability to deliver the plan. So in terms of growth, the workforce may already have the capability to deliver the plan, but much more likely is if the business is about to diversify into a different product line or maybe even move um, to an international base, it's likely that the current workforce has limited capability in these areas and therefore you'd be able to slot your present workforce into existing roles and maybe need to turn to the external labour market to fulfil the capability needed to um, fulfil the roles either internationally or in a different product line. Once this is done, the actions need to be agreed and an implementation plan would be developed. So here it will be necessary to agree the assessment and the evaluation criteria. And then another important step is to regularly review the outcomes. 
and this would be done with all of the key stakeholders within the organisation. Another interesting aspect of workforce planning is to look at how does it link to other HR practices. So here in this diagram you can see that there's links with resource and talent management, organisational design and development, employee engagement and learning and talent development. So if we start with its link to resource and talent management. As in the previous slide, when we were looking at the different strategies, so perhaps there's a growth strategy or an expansion strategy or perhaps uh, diversifying into a different product, it may be necessary for your organisation to recruit people from outside of the organisation to be able to bring new skills in or it very well could be that you can develop your own internal development programme which will grow the talent from within and in all likelihood you're probably going to do a bit of both. Workforce planning also links to organisational design and development in that the organisational design will encompass both the uh, location of the work but also the jobs itself and the roles that will be undertaken. So depending on perhaps uh, the structure of the organisation and the positions or the roles within each of those departments, that will also have an impact on the skills that are required and also the number of people that are required to be able to carry out those skills. Employee engagement features as you can do everything that you want in terms of upskilling the workforce and maybe recruiting people from the external labour market. But if you don't keep the employees that you already have engaged, they're likely to leave the organisation and you will be constantly chasing the magic number or chasing the skills that you need for the organisation. So it's really important that you take care of your existing employees to get them to stay and get their skills to stay in the organisation. But it's also really important that once you've got new recruits, that you deliver on what you've recruited them into. So if you told them a role would be X, Y and Z, then the role does need to include X, Y and Z. But you also need to get them engaged really quickly so that they don't leave in the first few months. Learning and talent development is also linked to workforce planning in that once you've done your skills analysis or you've done a gap analysis, you'll be able to tell what your current workforce has in terms of skills and what they need. And then you'll be able to uh, develop or design programmes or uh, learning courses, uh, development programmes, management development programmes, coaching sessions and so on so that the current employees and new employees will be able to develop their skills as quickly as possible. Here's an activity for you to do on workforce planning. Take a look at the Tesco case study. So number one, read the information provided on Tesco's approach to workforce planning and bear in mind that this case study was brought together in 2008. Bring it up to date by thinking of how the organisation's fortune has changed recently and how might Tesco use workforce planning now to restructure and downsize. And then finally, you need to think about what role would HR take in this process. To do this and access the case study, you'll need to use your QR code reader that you've already downloaded onto your phone. Scan this code and it will take you directly to the Tesco case study. When you've done that and you've accessed the case study, pause this video whilst you're answering the questions on the case study and when you're ready, start the video again. Another aspect of workforce planning can be shown using this business model, which is Atkinson's Flexible Firm. So we've talked about this in the previous couple of weeks. Atkinson's Flexible Firm 
is to improve agility or flexibility amongst organisations and comprises of the core workforce, variable staff and peripheral workers. So in addition to improving the overall skills within the organisation, it's also important for the organisation to be as flexible as possible. And flexibility is important because of the rate of change in the external environment environment and for the organisations to be able to adapt to the changes really quickly. Some of the flexibility types given by Atkinson were external numerical flexibility. So this is where the company's got the ability to increase or decrease the total headcount and so organisations would do this based on peaks and troughs in demand. So an example of this would be um, Christmas temps or perhaps using temporary contracts, fixed term contracts and even zero hours and casual contracts. So all of these lumped together are known as atypical contracts. Another form of flexibility is internal numerical flexibility. So sometimes uh, this would be called as working time flexibility or temporal flexibility. And this is where the company adjusts the working hours or schedules of people that are already employed in the company. So this would be achieved through part-time workers, flexi time, flexible working, um, maybe different shifts, weekend shifts and overtime. So a benefit of this would be that the people in the business would already be trained so they're more likely to be able to, um, to perform to the required levels and they'll just do more or less of it as uh, demands dictate. Functional flexibility is another type um, depicted by this model and this involves uh, the company being able to transfer people across different activities and tasks within the firm. So quite often this is achieved through job rotation or multi-skilling and so people can be moved from department to department. And then the final aspect of uh, flexibility is financial or wage flexibility and this is where pay levels aren't decided collectively, so um, the employment cost can reflects, reflect the supply and demand of labour. So this would be where you're able to discuss on an employee-by-employee employee basis uh, rather than having to stay with a fixed rate right across the workforce. So as I said before, this is made up of the core workforce, variable staff and peripheral workers. So the organisation usually employs a relatively small core workforce, so they're your permanent full-time employees, and they'd be trained to be functionally fl flexible and they'd be responsible to carry out the key uh, competencies for the organisation. So because they want to develop, uh, the organisation wants to develop long-term relationship with these individuals, they would often be given the best um, terms of reward and employment security. But to protect the employment of the core workforce, organisations also make use of the periphery workforce and uh, these would be used to upsize or downsize as required. So as mentioned before, that would give you the numerical flexibility through temps and so on. And um, here you'd... Uh, you'd have um, internal and external numerical flexibility because you'd be able to ask current people to flex up or do overtime, which would give you the internal flexibility, or you'd be able to take more people on if necessary to improve, increase your headcount, and that would give you your external numerical flexibility. So having provided an overview of Atkinson's flexible firm model, I'd like you now to take a few minutes and try to think for yourself how can Atkinson's model aid workforce planning and it might be beneficial for you to think of this in your own organisation but would be useful for you to include this in the assignment um, very generally so this could apply to any organisation. When you're ready, restart the video and we'll start to have a look at the tools that you can use for workforce planning. In activity three, you're also asked to talk about workforce planning tools. 
I've included four here. However, due to the restricted word count, I'd suggest that you choose two to include in your assignment. The tools available are workforce strategy maps, scenario planning, span and gap analysis and organisational benchmarking. Workforce strategy maps would be drawn up if you could predict the future. So for some organisations that perform in a steady environment, it's easy or easier for them to predict the future and therefore produce the strategy map. An example would be if the organisation was looking to grow and expand, a strategy map would be developed which would indicate where the extra headcount and skills were needed. Likewise, if the organisation was looking to downsize, a workforce strategy map would be drawn up which would indicate the reduced numbers or the reduced skills needed. And if the organisation was looking to diversify or move overseas, a workforce strategy map could be developed which would indicate, again, the number of heads but also the skills needed in the new divisions. The downside to workforce strategy maps is that the environment is always changing and unless you operate in a really steady market, these would be difficult to rely on. Another tool is scenario planning and this is where the organisation would try to uh, anticipate different scenarios. So perhaps they would draw up a plan for what if this happens and a plan for what if that happens. Span and gap analysis looks at the capabilities of the current workforce or the, um, the availability of the current workforce and then looks at what the organisation predicts it will need and looks at the gap and starts to come up with ways of how you can actually plug that gap. So whether this is through extra training or extra recruitment, but that's what the analysis is designed to do. And organisational benchmarking is having a look at your competitors and see what they're doing in terms of the workforce. So it might be that they are increasing their headcount. It might be that they want to improve the customer service. It could be that they're decreasing their headcount because they've become more automated. It could be that they're offering a more competitive rate of pay, which means that your competitors are at an advantage they're able to attract and recruit the best candidates so you need to organizational benchmark regularly to make sure that you're not missing out on any tricks for more information on these tools if you scan this code it will take you straight through to the hay group St strategic workforce planning brochure and it will give you more information and more insight into each of these tools now, like I said, just pick two to include in your assignment. You will not have the word count to include all four. Activity four, concentrate on succession planning and talent planning. So for this activity, you need to have a look at the checklist that I've also sent alongside this presentation. The basics of Activity 4 are that you need to give a brief account of the role of HR in developing succession planning processes. You need to say how HR would develop those succession planning processes when contributing to downsize situations. So it's quite easy for us to understand how we can succession plan when the company is planning to grow. But when the company is planning to downsize, it's a little bit more difficult you also need to be able to give a brief account of how HR develop basic succession planning processes and include things like the development of job descriptions, person specs and competency frameworks. Now the checklist also indicates that you should include advising and supporting managers, ensuring compliance with the law and good practice and also providing appropriate frameworks and templates. The definitions of talent planning and succession planning are provided in the CIPD fact sheets. The talent planning, for according to the fact sheet, is talent planning ensures that the company has the right skills and people in place now and in the future to ensure that the company can meet its objectives and this may involve turning to the labour market for more people. 
For more information on talent planning and talent management, go to the fact sheet through this link. The terms talent planning and succession planning are often used interchangeably. However, whereas talent planning refers to the whole of the organisation, succession planning is usually focused on ensuring that the organisation has got sufficient numbers of people with the ability, the knowledge, the personal attributes and experience to be able to step up to the next level when a position becomes vacant. So in the past, this has been reserved for leaders of the organisation or people at the higher levels of the organisation. However, this is starting to change. And for more information on succession planning, you can go to the CIPD fact sheet through this link. So looking at succession planning and talent planning and the use within the business, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the original focus of succession planning was aimed at the highest levels in the organisation. It was a process for identifying and developing potential leaders or senior managers, and this was known as the exclusive approach. More recently, its focus has changed to cover the whole workforce, and this is now known as the inclusive approach. So rather than targeting specific individuals for specific roles, the aim is to develop pools of talent from which a replacement can be selected if a vacancy arises. And you can read more about that in the previous version of the textbook by Taylor and Woodhams that was published in 2012. So what's the role of HR in talent management and succession planning? Here you need to pause the video while you access the talent management fact sheet on the CIPD website. Have a read for more details about HR can be involved. Once you've done that, move on to the succession planning fact sheet also available on the CIPD website and this will also indicate how HR is involved in succession planning. Another aspect of Activity 4 is that you are asked to describe the role of HR in the planning process. So you would be expected to outline the outputs of the planning process. So please refer to the checklist to make sure that you've included everything that you should. Some of the outputs of the planning process would include the job description, a person spec or specification and the competency framework. So a job description explains the job to candidates and it helps the recruitment process by providing a clear guide to all involved about the requirements of the job. So this would be necessary both in terms of the talent planning and succession planning process so that internal candidates would be able to understand what's necessary before they start to apply for the job and also for external candidates to get an understanding of the role. The person specification or the job profile states the necessary and desirable criteria for selection and this works alongside the job description in providing more information for both internal and external candidates. The competency framework sets out and defines each individual competency, so things like problem solving or people management and it would uh, describe what was required by individuals working in the organisation or in a certain part of the organisation. So you'll find more information on these tools or outcomes of the planning process in the recruitment fact sheet, again on the CIPD website, and in the competency and competency framework fact sheet available through these links straight through to the CIPD website. So just to summarise, on the activity four, you are asked to comment on the role of HR and you are um, pointed towards including that you should advise and support managers, you ensure compliance with the law and good practice and provide appropriate frameworks and templates. So the fact sheets will provide information on all of these areas. So let's have a quick review. After watching the video, you should be able to answer all of the following questions. If you can, that's great. If you struggle on any of them, perhaps you need to revisit part of the video or the fact sheet explaining the part that you're stuck on. So number one, what does succession planning help a company to do? 
Number two, what would a benefit of succession planning be? Number three, give a practical example of how you could prepare people for their next role. And number four, what is the aim in talent planning or career development planning for the company? Number five, what is a benefit to the individual? Number six, explain Atkinson's flexible firm. Number seven, how might you use this model in the workplace? And number eight, which of the groups in the model will be most interested in succession planning and why? Have a think about these eight questions and try to come up with a short answer. So take a break in the video and when you're ready, come back for the next couple of slides. So we've now completed our aims and objectives. Our aim was to introduce workforce succession and talent planning, which we've done. And by the end of the session, it was hoped that you would be able to discuss workforce planning and make recommendations for its use in different scenarios. We've had a look at that. We've had to look for downsides. We've had to look for growth. We've had to look for expansion and diversification. You are also expected to be able to define succession and talent planning and discuss their use within the business. Look at a business model and determine how it can aid workforce planning. And we did that through the Atkinson's flexible firm model. And then evaluate the role of HR in workforce succession and talent planning. This is an activity that you were asked to complete. Move on to the next slide when we'll have a look at the bibliography entries. Here are the bibliography entries of the resources that we've used throughout this session. As usual, I've made some deliberate mistakes, so take a few minutes and see if you can spot them. Pause the video and have a look, and when you're ready, move on to the next slide, which will show you the answers. OK, now you've had a chance to have a look at the bibliography. Let's see the correct format. The first thing you'll notice is that the entries have been presented in a different order. This is because there are several entries from CIPD of 2015. When the author and the date are identical, the next way to decide the order of your entries in the bibliography is to move to the title of the article. In this case, Competence and Competency Frameworks is the first article to produce to be presented alphabetically and therefore should be the first entry in the list. An additional mistake on the previous slide for this entry was the competence and competency frameworks, which is the title of the article, was not presented in italics. In the second entry, which is now the succession planning fact sheet, the mistake on the previous slide was that there was no date given. On the third entry, which is now the talent management fact sheet, the mistake on the previous slide was that the full hyperlink to the fact sheet was not provided. The link was provided to the CIPD website, but not to the actual fact sheet itself. The next entry, which is now workforce planning, was an easy mistake to spot in that the title was not given in italics. The next one, which is now the recruitment fact sheet, has changed in the order that it's been presented in. You can see that it's now the fifth entry in the bibliography, and this is because this fact sheet was published in 2016. As the author is the same, in this case the CIPD, you then move to the date to decide the order that your entry should be presented in in the bibliography. As all the other entries were published before 2016, they come before this entry in the list and then the recruitment fact sheet follows them. So the recruitment fact sheet should be presented fifth in your list. The next one is Stephen Taylor's resource and talent management textbook. And the mistake here was that it was published in London and by the CIPD and on the previous slide, they were presented the other way around. And the final entry, there were several mistakes, so I hope you spotted them all. The first one was that after the initial for S for Stephen, there was no full stop, and then the title of the article 
managing people and organisations was not presented in italics. And then the final mistake was that London and CIPD were presented the wrong way around. So thanks for taking the time to listen and watch the video and for completing the exercises. So you can't put it off any longer. It's now time to go off and do activity three and activity four.